Hi, I'm Kip Akins. I'm the Director of Operations here at Pleasant Grove Baptist Church. We're glad you decided to join us this morning. We hope you enjoy the sermon. Good morning. Y'all stand and worship with us this morning. and what this church is all about. Well, the heart of the matter is this. We're a group of people doing our best to love God and love those around us. One of the ways we express this love is through worship because our God is truly amazing. He created everything, great and small, and His love for us is incredible, powerful, and completely unconditional. We also spend time looking into His Word, the Bible, and receive practical teaching to guide us along His path in our everyday lives. But it doesn't end when the service is over. 
Throughout the week, we gather in groups to serve, pray, reach out to our community, and sometimes just to hang out and have fun. Life is full of challenges, and none of us are perfect. But we believe that's one of the reasons God has brought us together. We're all here to help and support each other through each step of life's journey, because nobody should have to travel alone. So thanks for joining us today. No matter who you are, we want you to know you are welcome. Well, it says it all. I'm glad you're here this morning. I met some new faces today for the very first time. And so if you're being here for the very first time or it's been a long time, I'd love for you to go back there to the guest information to see Sherry. Uh, when we have a time of fellowship, fill out some information uh, about yourself, and we'd like to give you some information about the church. So let's stand together as they play. Find somebody. Welcome to the God's house. And uh, we're glad you decided to join us this morning.
promises of God. Amen. Because if you stand on his promise and you do exactly what he said in his word, that is give. And yeah, I promise you, he will bless you. I'm a living testimony of that. Amen. We're going to call our ushers up and we're going to go ahead and have prayer. And we just ask you to be blessed, that you be blessed today, that you also bless God and just give back what he has given us. Amen. May we pray. Father God, we come for you today just saying thank you. Thank you for allowing us all to come into this place of worship today. Just just having it be what you want it to be and just allow us free reign to worship you, the one and only true king. We ask that you bless this offering that it may be used to uplift and build your kingdom more in your son Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Remain standing. Let's continue worshiping. Come on, put your hands together this morning.
just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Come on, sing it again. And
thank you for your mercy and your grace like an ocean that we're sinking in this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for God that we can serve the one who loves us so, so much. Lord, I pray that somebody here today learn of that love like they've never had in their human life before. And that can only come from you, Lord. Thank you for loving us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. I'm glad you're here this morning. Um, I am wrapping up uh, a series on heaven that, um, that I've been preaching for about the last six weeks. And, um, but I, I have to kind of give you a disclaimer, not that I'm, not that I'm trying to scare you, but I, I want to be honest this morning. And then, uh, there's some things that are on my mind as your pastor. And, uh, I feel like, um, I feel like it's kind of like a family meeting sitting in the living room and uh, the dads want to get all the kids around in a circle. Not that I think I'm the dad and you're the kids because um, most of you in here are younger than I am. So anyway, um, but here's what I do know is there's things about being your pastor that I am so overjoyed by. But I'm going to be honest with you, there's some things that are, that, are, that, are on, that are a nerve to me. And the only thing I've ever been able to do as your pastor is just to be honest. And that's okay if we're honest according to the word of God. Amen. So uh, I hope that uh, my prayer this morning has been that the Lord would, um, that the Lord would know my heart and, um, and that what I say would be taken in the spirit of God, not in, a, in the flesh, because I'm not mad. I was a little anxious when I was typing. I had to be, I had a few keys broke on my typewriter when I was typing with this, but uh, But I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of John, chapter 14. And then I'd also like for you to hold that place and turn over to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, as our text this morning. If you're visiting this morning for the very first time, I'll tell you something. We serve a God who loves us unconditionally. It doesn't matter where you've come from where you are or where you think you might be planning on going. Uh, God, is, God loves you so much that he'll take you just like you are, but God loves you so much he fails to, he, he, re, he refuses to leave you that way. And scripture says, is if, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things become new. And what I realize sometimes is that sometimes I've been made new in Christ, <laughs> just sometimes I don't act like I've been made new in Christ. Anybody else would join me in that circle? And uh, we don't always act right. I don't know about you, but I don't. And um, some of you say, yeah, I've been meaning to talk to you about that. Well, save it. I realize it. Just pray for me. I'm a work in progress, just like you are and we all are. But I want you to read this scripture with me. It's John chapter 14, verse 6. And Jesus said these things. He said, I am the, say it with me. I am the, I am the, and I am the. And now listen to this part. And no man comes to the Father but by now, I want to say this before we go to the next scripture, and that is if you came or you think you're going to heaven or you came believing that you're a believer any other way, then I want you to know you're not. There ain't but one way to heaven. He's not a best way. He's not a good way. He's not the most popular way. But according to the word of God, scripture teaches that Jesus is the only way to heaven. If you try to come any other way than that, then you're not going to make it. Simple as that. Look over at Hebrews chapter 10. Scripture says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much more, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, I want to just pick out a few words of that while you've got it open right there. It's not on the screen, I know that. But I want you to pick out a few words and it says not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. The word forsake is mean to just say, uh, I'm not going to do it. We pretty much know what that is. The assembling together is when the body of Christ gets together. So to, to discredit any of these, these sayings that I can worship God just as much on my deer stand as I can the house of God, that goes against Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, for you to say, well, I can worship God anywhere uh, because he, I am the church. But scripture teaches that you and me are supposed to be applied and supposed to be using our gift in the local body. How many of you believe that? Say amen. 
So if you are unattached, it's kind of like an arm that's over here just in the grass by itself, it's an arm. It has to be attached to the body for that arm to do what God intended for it to do. He says another thing, but exhorting one another. Can I, can I help you with something? Sometimes you coming to church is not so much about you getting something. You coming to church most of the time is about you giving something. See, you have a spiritual gift. You, listen, there is a need for you to be here. Some of you can play music, some of you can't. So those that can't shouldn't try to do. Those of you should teach. If you can teach, you ought to teach. If you can't teach, then you ought to be a student. Whatever the case, you have a gift. And the body of Christ is not what the body of Christ should be when you're not here because you're a part of the body. My dad has been passed away for six years, uh, seven, eight years, sorry. And when he died, he had this finger gone right here. And you may know this if you have a, if you have a missing limb, but they have something called phantom pain. And my dad, till the day he died, after that, after that lawnmower wreck that cut his finger off and messed up other two fingers, my dad found every way in the world to do everything he'd always done. But he said many times he would go to bed at night and that finger would itch that wasn't there. It would itch so, so bad. You know what? I think it's because that phantom pain, I don't know this, but I think it's because that finger is supposed to be attached. That finger's not supposed to be somewhere out there laying in the yard because you cut it off. It's supposed to be attached. And see, you'll never be what you should be as a believer being unattached from the body of Christ. You're not. God never intended you to fly solo. He never intended you to do your own thing. Well, I have a ministry, but I'm not a part of a church. That's not according to scripture. See, what Christ did, Christ died for the church. That's us. Christ died for the church, and what you have to do is that your ministry, if you have one, should line up under the guidelines of the local church according to the word of God in Ephesians chapter five and six. But here's what I want you to understand is a lot of people say, well, I was hurt at this church, so I'm just gonna love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the church, I ain't got time for the church, but I'm just gonna love God. Once again, you are still out of context of the word of God. And so we have to understand is that what does it mean to be a part of the body of Christ? Well, look at these two words right here when it says, but exhorting one another, listen to me. Some of you have gifts that other people in the body need. And when you're not here, they don't get ministered to like they should because the person that was gonna do the ministry to them that they needed is not there because you're unattached. So I said, well, it won't matter if I'm gone. Everybody needs a break. Yeah, but when you take a break, and I know we all need that, and I'm gonna take one, I understand that. But you need to understand that quickly you better get back because God has somebody that needs the ministry that only you can bring because your spiritual gift is unique to you and God gave it to you. Now, he didn't give you your spiritual gift for you. Your spiritual gift was not given to you so you can say, son, I have the gift of encouragement. So I'm gonna look in the mirror and I'm gonna encourage myself. No, he gave you your spiritual gift so that when you're around people, people are better when they're around you than when they are by themselves. That is a spiritual gift. That's not a personality. That is a spiritual gift that comes from the Holy Spirit when you are saved. Scripture teaches we all have one. In the last five weeks, I've preached on the subject of heaven. And I'll be, I'll be honest with you, I don't begin to do justice to the heavenly city, but I can read the word and I can ask the Holy Spirit to give me insight on those things that I don't understand. How many of you understand? How many of you through the last five weeks understood everything that I preached and know exactly what I was saying? And I'm telling you, you, you as clear as, as it could be, raise your hand. No hands. You know why? Because I didn't even understand it. So why did you preach it? Because it's in the Bible. But I don't, I'll be honest with you, I'm still a student. I'm still trying to figure things out. And so we understand that, that we can't even do it justice sometimes. But here's what I'm gonna do. As I grow in the Lord, I'm gonna trust him to give me clarity of what the word says. How many of you are still a work in progress, amen? amen. See, we have a great deal of detail to the subject of heaven. And out of all the incredible things that we have shared about heaven, I wanna be honest with you this morning, the opposite is true about a place called hell. According to the Bible, hell is the final place for those who don't accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. 
Many parents will have children that will go to heaven while they have rolled the dice and they will spend an eternity in hell. I'll be honest with you, I can't help but believe based on Luke chapter 16, I can't help but believe that the entire time of eternity, those of you that are separated from God, I don't know, if it, I don't know, but I'm just, I'm just, this is what I'm thinking. While you're in a place called hell because you rolled the dice, you're separated from God and you're separated from your family, maybe, just maybe, you'll be able to see them in heaven while you'll never get out of a place called the lake of fire. I was talking to a guy this morning. He said, I don't know what would be worse, burning or seeing my family enjoying Jesus for eternity. I want to address parents this morning concerning the decisions that you make and the things you say about yourselves and for your kids. Now, I want everybody to look this way. You can see me, but I can't hardly see you. So I don't have anybody in mind this morning, and I don't have an ax to grind. But God gave me this stuff on Monday, and I just feel like that you need to hear it. And if you don't need to hear it, then it's for somebody sitting right next to you, okay? Here's what I do know. When I get through this morning, there will be many that will be glad and they'll say thanks for sharing the truth. But there will also be many that will walk out of here mad and thinking that that old preacher is just way too hard. I was talking to Mike Dobbs this week, and Mike's in here. And Mike's one of our character, one of our new character coaches, FCA, at, at the, um, for the fishing, for the sport of fishing. Man, I wish to goodness they would have had that when I was in school. I would have never went to class. I didn't go to class anyway, but I would have done something productive, you understand. And he said, Chris, when I was a young guy like these guys that are fishing, he said, the last thing I wanted was a, just a Bible-thumping preacher. I didn't want that in my face all the time. I didn't want nothing to do with it. He said, here I am later in life. And he said, I'm sitting under one every single Sunday morning. <laughs> he said, and here's the reason I do it, because I, I, I know I need it. Let me tell you something. You may not like everything that the Bible teaches. You may not even like the way that it's shared. But understand that every one of us need the word of God in our life. Every one of us must hear the word of God. And listen, this, it's not even just hearing the word of God. Every one of us need to adhere to the word of God. The word adhere literally means to take action, <laughs> to do. So there's a, there, there, let me give you some things that parents say. Now, I know that I'm preaching to the choir and none of you are in here, but when you get home, you can tell your friends, hey, listen, this is for you. But many parents are guilty of saying, well, son, it doesn't matter where you go to church as long as you go. I want you to know that's nothing further from the truth than that statement. You need to be in a place where you grow in the Lord, a place where the word of God is te taught and preached, and you need to be in a place where you're challenged to live for God and the challenge to love God. You say, but today, every church, the churches aren't doing that like they used to. I understand that. But I want you to understand that, that the scripture teaches that in the last coming of the last days, those times, there's gonna be a great falling away and then they're gonna heap up for themselves teachers that will say what they wanna hear because they have, they have itching ears. They want somebody to say something that's pleasing to the ear. And I'll be honest with you, it's very tempting to do that many, many times. Only problem is you don't get a pass from God of saying what you want to say and saying what the word of God says. So we want to be challenged to live for God. And let me tell you something, for many of us, our social media gives us a way as to what's going on, really going on in our life. The sad thing is that for many, they think that they're hiding the example from their kids and your kids are smarter than you are. They get it. They know you're one thing at home and you're another thing at the house of God. They know you're one thing at the college football game and you're another thing at the house of God. They know that you're one thing at work. They know that you're one thing when you come home from work at home and you're another thing at the house of God. There are also parents that will tell you this. Well, we used to enjoy coming, but my kids don't like to come that much anymore. Used to, on Sunday nights, when I was a kid, I know that they did have TV back then. But at 7 o'clock, the Mickey Mouse Club came on. The wonderful world of Disney. 
And I would pray that the heat or the air or the lights would go off in the church so we wouldn't have to go. Because I done heard my daddy preach all week. I sure didn't want to go in here twice on Sunday. I'd rather been at the ball game. I'd rather been at the lake or whatever other excuse I could find to keep myself out of church. Here's what I think. You may like this, you may not like this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. I don't think it's that your kids don't like church as much as that you don't like church and you use them as an excuse to why you're not in church. See, because the Bible says that a carnal man cannot understand the things of God. So when the spirit of God begins to move, something happens to you and you're sitting, you're thinking, whoa, wait a minute, I didn't come for all this. I just wanted to come and enjoy. Listen, a person living in open sin should feel welcome at the house of God, but he or she should not feel comfortable at the house of God. If the spirit of God is at work and the spirit of God is flowing and conviction is here and the spirit of God is convicting souls and you're one of them, you're not gonna feel very comfortable sitting in your seat. All you're gonna be thinking about is somebody told him I was coming and they don't even know you. It's the spirit of God. So here's what happens that the, the church is faced with trying to trying to compete with Disney and frills and all the stuff. And I'm gonna tell you something, we like all that stuff. In fact, Denise wants to put a slide from the top floor to the bottom floor in the children's building. We're going to, she said. Okay. It is spoken. <laughs> I'll have to tell you this uh, Jennifer and David's little boy, Silas. They're staying with us when they're, until they get moved back here on the weekends. And Silas is in a one at a church where they're at in Cartersville and Silas learned his Bible verse and it was Psalms 33, seven, 33, nine. And he can't say his words were good. The, the verse says, and he spoke and it was so. Is that, is that right? It was done. And he spoke and it was done. He can't say his sentence, he can't say his words were good. He was so proud of that. He said, Psalms 33, 9, and he smoked, and it was done. <laughs> I said, I didn't know Jesus had that habit. I did not know that. <laughs> oh, I love it. He was proud of that word of God, though. He was proud of sharing that scripture. Yeah. See, there are times, in fact, so Chris, you ever, you ever get to a point where you don't want to come to church? Yes. Well, why do you come? Because I like to eat. That's as real as I know how to put it. There are a lot of times I'm thinking, I don't want to go today. Then he said, honey, you might want to get out of bed. You're the preacher. You might want to show up. In fact, she did tell me that one time. I was complaining about people not being here. She said, honey, if you were not the preacher, you wouldn't go today. I said, you shut your mouth. You need to <laughs> repent. <laughs> Oh, I hate it when they're right, don't you? <laughs> Here's what I've learned. Today, everything is more important than the house of God. Some may call me a legalist and that things were different when I played and when I was playing ball back then. You're right, it was. But maybe, but maybe the reason is that so much is going on for our kids is because we as people of God allow those things to go in. We're allowing the world to set our standards instead of believers setting the standards for what's going to happen in your home. Now, I know that doesn't fly well. I get it. But parents, listen to me. You're the parent. You can get mad all you want, send ugly emails, but the truth is whatever you allow in moderation, your kids will do in excess. Whatever you allow. I, let, let me just ask you a question. I, I can barely see your hand. I put my hands where I can't see your hands. How many of you, when you have kids in the formidable years, I'm talking about zero to maybe 10, you feel like all you, now if you're, if you're not a parent that believes in spanking, well, God help you. But if you were one of those that believes the word of God, how many of you raise your hand and say, I feel like all I do is beat kids. Look, JR was the first one up. Yeah. Listen, I want to tell you what happened in my house last night. My dog's got dog toys everywhere. And I'm gonna tell you, I'm so impressed with David and Jennifer, not because they're here, but I, I'm, watching, I'm watching the real deal behind the scenes. 
David gets up, man, he don't wait for mama to do it. He gets up, gets kids in the shower, and she gets, I mean, it's just, a, it's, like a, it's like a machine. But when last night when they came in, the machine was broke a little bit and needed a touch. So they came in, and Silas found one of the dog toys, and he's throwing it, and he throws it on the lamp. David says, don't throw that again, Silas. Silas looked at him like, yeah, right. <laughs> one more time, we're going to go and have prayer meeting in the bathroom, son. Well, that wasn't good enough. He took that thing, chunked on the lamp again. He went over there and Silas was scooting back. He grabbed him by that ankle and slid him across that couch. <laughs> and I noticed when I came in, Silas was healed. <laughs> I mean, all David had to do was say, he was like. <laughs> and he came back out sanctified, full of the Holy Spirit. I mean, just. <laughs> Here's another excuse I hear. Well, I don't think you should make your kids go to church because when they're old, they're gonna resist it. Let me turn it around. You make them take a bath. You make them brush their teeth because if you don't, they're not gonna get a spouse and all their teeth gonna fall out. Think about that the next time you say, we ain't going, you ain't got to go. <laughs> See, I had a drug disease when I was 12 years old. Some of you had that same disease. At 12 years old, I was the biggest drug addict you could imagine. My daddy would grab me by the ear and he would drag me out the door. He would drag me into the old car with the bass fiddle sitting there with our necks like that so we could get to church. I have a permanent disc problem right here because of that thing. have a lot of fun with the fact of saying that, let me tell you something, parents, your kids are in your house because your job, according to the word of God, is to lead them according to the word of God. It is your job to train them. It is not the pastor. It is not the youth pastor. It is not the children's department. It is not the school. It is yours. And what happens is if we back up and say, well, I'm just going to put all that on my kids. Let me tell you something. Get ready. Because you may not put it on them, but they will put it back on you. I heard a thing on game day. I watch it a lot on Saturday morning when I'm drinking coffee, and I heard this. And he said, fall in love with the process, and the process will love you back. He wasn't talking about parenting, but I applied it to parenting thinking, yes, yeah, that's a good statement. The process of you setting standards and guidelines for your family is the, I'm going to be honest with you, it's the hardest thing I ever did. Hardest thing I ever did. If I'd had Leslie first, Russ, if you're listening, if I'd had Leslie first, we'd have had 10 kids. <laughs> but I had Russ first. And she was an accident. We didn't want no more after him, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Tough, man. Tough. I rearranged every bathroom in Dalton, Georgia. I'm telling you, I did. Can I ask you to do me a favor, parents? Please set some standards for your kids and for your home. Not just the house of God, but Jesus himself. But set some standards because here's the thing. If you don't implant some standards, it is literally going to be by a miracle of the Holy Spirit that when they get out of your house, they're going to walk a straight line. It's going to be something you've got to implant in them. Are they going to stray? You better believe they're going to stray. Listen, I was, in, I was on the little Amazon River. Uh, Jul Help me, Leslie. When would you get saved? There you go. I was on the little Amazon River in, in, out in the middle of Honduras. I'm out, it was a jungle, man, Mosquito Coast. And I got a call. Well, I didn't really get a call. The chat Ford came up to me and said, let me have your cell phone. He turned off all every, social media. He blocked it, said, you can't even get on Facebook and do nothing. I thought, well, what did I do? He said, there's some news coming when you get home. So you're not gonna, you're gonna be a surprise to you. I remember getting off of the, off the plane and I went through the, went through the uh, corridor there and I came through and I saw my family and they were, dad, dad, dad. And I got there, I said, what is the news that I'm supposed to know? Russ and Leslie looked at me at the same time and said, we got saved 
last Sunday at church. I went to holler and people probably thought, what is wrong with him? It was the greatest news I could ever have when I got home. I was on a, whatever day that was, the next week, Russ came to my office. I never knew Russ had anything going on in his life. And I, I didn't say my kid was perfect. Don't hear me say that. But I had set standards and we had had, we had, had many conversations and I, I thought, you know, he's been honest with me about some things and I'm talking, I knew him inside and out. But after that Sunday, him sitting in my office, he began to tell me things that I was unprepared for. He began to tell me some things that were going on or had gone on in his life. I finally stopped him. I said, I've heard enough. I don't need to hear anymore. But I don't need to tell you. I said, oh, no, you don't. That's under the blood, son. Let's go forward. I'm telling you, as good as you think your kids are, there's going to be a day when you're going to get some news that's not going to be your favorite news. So I'm telling you, mom and dad, you're not, rain, rain, you're not, you're not raising angels and cherubims. You're not. You're raising real people real kids. And here's the thing, you are raising them so that they will leave your house. Leslie. <laughs> oh my Lord. <laughs> oh my goodness. And we're giving you practice right now. <laughs> oh my goodness. Here's what I've learned, that as parents, we prioritize everything in our kid's life except for the things of God and the things of church. Please allow the Lord's house, the Lord and his house to be a place of priority. But more the house of God being a priority, set a standard that Jesus is your priority. i tell you something else that I need to, that I need to take out of my clip. I'm, I'm feeling very free today. Yeah. I feel festive, okay? <laughs> Some of you won't get anything else but that the rest of the day, okay? John, you know this. Where you at, John? Back here. Nate, you know this too. Nate. You sleep? See. There he is, right there. I, just, I caught him and had to look and say, "Alive, baby, how you doing?" I'm worried about our pastor. Yeah, I am too. Here's what I've learned: if people miss church for a while and you call them, you'd be surprised how many of them are mad that you called. Or if you don't call, well, I've I've been there in a while. Nobody called me. So you're doomed. You call them if they hadn't been here. You call them if they have been here. They hate you either way. I love this one. They've been gone four months. And I say, hey, man, missed you Sunday. Or I missed, been miss, I've been missing you. That's what I said. I've been missing you. Well, we had a stomach bug last week. Don't tell me what was going on in your house last week. But what happened the other 15 weeks before that? If you've been having a stump above 15 weeks, I ain't coming to your house, I'm telling you. <laughs> I, I'm gonna be honest with you. There are people that are sitting here right now, right now, that you probably feel sick every time you come to the house of God. I'm not being funny now, I'm telling you, but you come because you're like, I need a word from God. But I believe, I believe we're not careful where we have a church full of spiritual hypochondriacs. Something is always wrong, and if something is not wrong, we feel like something is wrong. Y'all tell you I got arthritis in my hands? We wake up in the morning trying to figure out what's, what hurts now. Denise said, I just slept wrong. Oh, dear Lord, where, is it? where are we going? Where are we going to go? Call 911. What are we doing? (laughs) 
We say, man, we're going to have a prayer time. I want to get. A, I want to meet some of the men in our church. Okay, Tuesday morning, we're going to have breakfast, and we're going to have a time of devotion, and we're going to just pray together, and it's going to last about as long as you can stay or as, as little as you can stay, but come, and guess what? It does this. We have prayer time on Tuesday night from 6 to 7, and man, I'm telling you what, we got all these prayer needs. People fill up our Pleasant Grove uh, prayer page, but they won't darken the door of praying at the house of God on Tuesday night. But let something happen in your life and the phone begins to blow up. Well, let me finish because I know some of you are saying, I'm done with this. And I'm about done with this. How about that? The whole point of the gospel is nothing about what I just shared. The gospel. I don't expect you to like everything I said, but if I offended you, that wasn't my goal at all. That's why I'm just, I want to just, I want to just try to talk through this. But I know that God laid this on my heart. It's tough for some people to hear. But when all the dust settles, the rest of the message is really, this is the bottom line. How many of you remember your first girlfriend in elementary school? Or boyfriend? I saw Stacy. I'm thinking, well, she got, I know she had a string of them. That's all I've ever heard. Yeah, okay. Then finally somebody checked the right box. I got you. What was your first love note to your significant other as a six-year-old? Everybody wrote the same thing. Somebody tell me. Do you love me? Check what? Look at the screen. Heaven or hell? Check yes or no. The gospel is actually that simple. That's the gospel right there. Because I can tell you something. To invite Jesus into your heart, you first have to make the choice, heaven or hell. I could stand up here and say, heaven or hell, let's pray. And you're thinking about, wow, I don't know. I saw this on a bumper sticker one day. Eternity, smoking or non-smoking? The thing about heaven or hell, you're either going or you're not. I'm gonna answer a few questions and I'm done. We're out of time. Here's the first question. Will children be in heaven? 100% yes. You say, well, what age do they not be in heaven? I've heard of something called the age of accountability. Well, that particular phrase is not in the Bible, but there's many, many, many phrases in the Bible that allude to children before they're able to decide between right and wrong. I'm gonna tell you something. God would not create your children. He wouldn't give you all the blessings and say, you know what? They didn't even have a chance. I'm gonna sit, no, that, that's not the God we serve. In fact, let me give you a scripture. Deuteronomy chapter one, verse 39 and 40. And your babies, this is out of the message, and your babies of whom you said, They'll be grabbed by plunder, and all these little ones who, who are, all these little kids who right now don't even know right from wrong, here, I love this part, they'll get in. <laughs> I'll take it, I, I'll give it, I'll give it to them. Yes, there'll be new owners, but not you. Here's you telling the children of Israel to go back to the wilderness, but I want you to see something that, man, it just rocked me when I seen this this morning. Verse 40, he says, but not you. Turn around and head back into the wilderness following the route to the Red Sea. And I thought about something. When Moses and the children of Israel would not believe God, God said, every one of you, and he uses this word, that's of age, will go back to the wilderness for 40 years. Well, look at the route they took. I believe God took them right back by the Red Sea right back by where they were living all this time, right back by, he would maybe remind them of every miracle and every time that they had trusted God and God had, had come through and they had to walk right past the greatest miracle in their life where the Red Sea was split in half to go back to the wilderness, thinking if we would have just believed God one more time. Wow. 
And I thought to myself, there are many times I have some regrets, but it would be bad to spend all of eternity and all I had was the regrets of what I didn't trust God for. You know, it's, a, it's amazing to me how that many people can sit in the house of God and they can hear year and week after week after week what it's going to take to go to heaven, but they continue to throw up a hand and say, no, not me. If I could tell you something that was going to say, listen, I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to give you a formula. Let's just say you're 50 years old, and I'm going to give you a formula that for the next 50 years, you have a promise of living the next 50 years. You're thinking, man, I want to have that. But in order to do that, maybe you're going to have to give up your coffee. Or maybe you're going to have to give up your boat. Or maybe you're going to have to give up your greatest job. Maybe you've got to give up your banking. I don't know what the give up is. There would be a majority that would say, I'll take it. I'll sacrifice, I'll take it. But there would be another group of people that would say, no, I'm not willing to give that up to have all that. And can I tell you something? That's what happens in the church every time where the gospel is shared. There's a group of people that says, yes, yes, yes. And there's a group of people that says, no, no, no. I know what it's going to take to go to heaven. I know what it's going to take for me to go to heaven, but I'm just not willing to roll the dice that way. I'm just going to roll the dice and just trust myself to go to heaven when I die. It'll happen some kind of way. I just don't know how. But I know what he says. I know it's the Bible, but surely I'll have time. Who's in heaven? People that have made Jesus Savior and Lord. Those children that have not grown old enough to know the difference between right and wrong. People with, maybe people with disabilities who do not even understand the gospel. And the scary part is that us as parents, we are responsible for training our children up. Scripture says, training our children up in the way that they should go so that when they were old, they will not depart from it. That's our responsibility. That's us. But who will not be in heaven? Those that have accepted Jesus, as those, those who have never accepted Jesus, those who have just prayed a prayer and surrendered lives to the Lord. Matthew 7, 21 says, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those that do the will of my Father, which is in heaven. For many on that day will say, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many wonderful works in your name? And then he will say, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Wow. As much as me as a believer, as much as you as a believer wants to hear a well done, good and faithful servant, I can promise you as an unbeliever, as much as we want to hear that, You're going to hear that if you think everything's okay, but you've never made Jesus Savior and Lord of your life. So why would you sit here and know what it's going to take to go and choose not to follow God? Many say, I want to go to heaven, but I'm not willing to do what it's going to take to get there. Let's pray together. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. Thanks so much for joining us today. I hope this sermon has spoken to your life. Whether you're sitting at home, maybe you're on the road or on vacation, or maybe you have a sick child, or maybe today you decide to stay home, but you came across our Facebook page or our website, you heard this sermon, and God spoke to your heart. Scripture says in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It also says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, behold, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things become new. Almost 33 years ago, I realized I was a whosoever and God changed my life. I was 19 years old. And I can tell you for 33 years, it's been as fresh today as it was then. Maybe today you want to make a decision for Christ or maybe you already have. We would love to hear from you. Maybe you could contact us on Facebook, call our phone, or you could just uh, look our website up. We would love to hear what God may have done in your life today. I hope you have a great week and we look forward to hearing from you.